All right, I am delighted to welcome Michael Leonard to the sixth edition of the LSE Taxation Seminar. Hmm? Uh, Michael will be talking about a fundamental issue, which is transfer pricing and transfer pricing arbitration and developing countries, a welcome or unwelcome stranger. Michael Leonard is Chief of International Tax, Tax Cooperation Section, Financing for Sustainable Development Office, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, United Nations, New York. He will be speaking from a personal, his personal capacity. And uh, after presenting his views on, on these fascinating topics um, for about 40 minutes, we will invite a panel of discussants to, to offer their questions and comments. Uh, the discussants are all LSE LLM candidates from a number of continents, Cameron Morrison from Australia, Nicolas Leiste from Germany, Nicolas Wolf also from Germany, Vicente Robles from Peru, and Andaman Limas Kuhn from Thailand. Um, Michael, the floor is yours. And once again, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to offer your views about this crucial topic. The floor is yours. Rule number one, unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Eduardo, and thank you to the students. Uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit, I, I'm the uh, head of the International Tax Cooperation Unit at the UN, but as Eduardo said, I'm not speaking in that capacity. I'm speaking in a personal capacity. But a lot of these issues about arbitration and transfer pricing have been uh, long-standing ones in the United Nations, but they're still very current. So I'll give some perspectives which draws upon my experience, but is very much in my personal capacity. And, and usually when people are talking about tax arbitration now, it's usually that they're talking particularly about transfer pricing. I think there's an acceptance that that's where a lot of the big issues will be. Uh, and, and therefore, I'll be talking generally about tax arbitration, but when I am, I'm really talking about transfer pricing particularly. And then I'm also, uh, there's a couple of issues which relate specifically to transfer pricing. So, and I've listened to Hans Moy's very good presentation, which was your last one. I worked many years ago with Hans in, uh, in the OECD at a time when the OECD was considering arbitration. So um, uh, that's been very helpful and I'll draw a few connections with some of the things that Hans has, has talked about. The current, I think everyone agrees that current tax treaty resolution is is imperfect, which is perhaps the nice way of putting at it, of putting it. Um, but there are different views about why it's imperfect. Um, it depends upon the agreement of competent authorities. Um, that's a, a means that you may not get that agreement. Um, you have to be admitted into the process, and there's various issues about whether uh, taxpayers can be improperly kept out of that process. There's no binding timelines, timelines and, and justice delayed, as we all know, can be justice denied or at least made more valuable. Uh, there's not necessarily consistent approaches between even the same country involved in mutual agreement procedures. There's interactions with domestic law, such, such as the time limits, which can, can confuse the process and cause some difficulties, particularly for taxpayers. And some people would say that, that the fact that it's secret is an imperfection at a time when uh, the citizenry is saying we want to ensure that multinational corporations are paying their taxes. The fact that MAP is, is secret is um, has drawn some criticism from maybe some of the different uh, interests involved in this. And just to give some background in the UN, when we think about stakeholders, obviously we think about taxpayers, obviously we think about governments, we think about civil society because they often represent the views of, of even people who don't pay tax for all the right reasons. We believe in the UN that one of the important stakeholders in tax systems is people who for all the right reasons don't pay tax because they're not earning enough and should be the beneficiaries of tax systems. And, and often um, uh, non-government organisations can actually express some of the concerns of those people who are not rep represented as uh, formally or as well as they 
uh, could be in, in, in terms of international tax policy. Um, some people along the same lines would say the fact that, that, that uh, uh, you can't have amicus curiae briefs in, in MAP from concerned citizenry is, is a, a flaw in the MAP system. And some taxpayers would say that, that the fact that the taxpayer doesn't really have a direct involvement because a MAP is, is a process between two representatives of the government is a defect. So you'll see there's all different potential imperfections, but sometimes people see it from a different perspective. Now, lately, there's been a push for mandatory binding arbitration in OECD fora, uh, seen most obviously in the OECD uh, model tax convention, which has a arbitral provision. We have one in the UN as well, but it's very much uh, an alternative. And it's very much for countries, if they're like-minded, if they both think think uh, arbitration is good that they can pick up uh, the provisions in the UN uh, model, which is a little bit different from the OECD model, though the OECD model provisions have come a little bit closer to the UN. I'll talk about that later. And, and particularly arbitration is very important in connection with Pillar 1. And now the discussion on Pillar 2, and this ties in with some of the talk you had from Hans recently. Um, and the results of that are still uncertain. The, the issue particularly of uh, some sort of international form of dispute resolution in Pillar 2 is, as you heard from Hans, it's, it's a little bit tricky because Pillar 2 is not a convention. It's, it's domestic legislation. And how do you uh, get agreement to have some sort of international approach to interpreting, for example, some of the terms in there, to have tribunals look at that. And, and it's probably even more challenging than Pillar 1 in one respect, because Pillar 1, if you're subject to the arbitral regime, it'll be because you joined up to the convention, because you ratified it. That's still a long way in future. We haven't even, even got to the signature ceremony. But for Pillar 2, um, one of these has been called the diabolical machinery of Pillar 2 is that even if you don't like Pillar 2, you have to respond to it if there's a critical mass of, of countries, of the right countries um, that take up Pillar 2. So that makes it even more difficult to get countries which may not actually like Pillar 2, but feel they have to respond to it, to agree that they really need some sort of international dispute resolution process rather than relying on, for example, their domestic uh, Law. So there's some really tricky issues uh, in uh, both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know, raise a few of those as we go along. And not because the, the I'm trying to criticise the work of the OECD in this area or, or drawing a conclusion about it, but because a lot of these issues will come up in other fora, maybe the UN in regional uh, environments and so forth. Many of the same issues will arise. Now, the fact is the OECD doesn't actually call this arbitration. <laughs> and there's a very good reason for that. They call it tax certainty. And uh, uh, the, the reason for this is because there is a real trust gap on arbitration in, in terms of, uh, of tax in developing countries. I think also in some developed countries. Um, but there's a bit of background to that, which I always think is important to, to know about. And that's uh, in particular, first of all, the fact that a lot of developing countries don't have a lot of arbitrations. Um, and those that they do have often been in the area of investment agreements. And uh, I used to negotiate investment agreements many, many years ago. And one of my view of the situation is that you thought you reached an agreement on what fair and equitable treatment, which Hans uh, mentioned, and which comes up in just about every every investment case, whether it's about tax or whether about something else, saying you you haven't given us fair and equitable treatment. And we we read that as negotiators having a very narrow customary international law meaning, which basically meant you 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 gave um, uh, a basic access to justice and and you know the the ability to get a wrong righted and things like that. Uh, maybe it extended to 
if there were rights in the area, maybe it extended to making sure that there was some um, um, uh, protection for for that property as well as other property, but very, very narrow in customary international law. But over time, the tribunals, which are generally regarded by developing countries as favouring the investors, have first of all found they've had jurisdiction in these matters. Not surprising because if they have jurisdiction, they can hear the case and it's, it's actually quite lucrative. <laughs> um, one member in the Cairn case that was mentioned is getting $1.2 million for his work in that case, which wasn't a particularly long case in the world of investment arbitrations and he would have done other things as well. Um, so, you know, the, these are uh, uh, some of the concerns that developing countries have that investment trees, first of all, the, the jurisdiction will be found, so it will be dealt with by the investment tribunal. And then secondly, that um, they do tend to delve deeply into government policies. You'll see that if you read the, the, the CAN uh, um, decision, which is public, a lot of them aren't public. Uh, delves deeply into the issue of, of, of issues of tax policy and, and raises some questions about whether retrospective tax policy is going to be contrary to fair and equitable treatment. Certainly the Indian one in, in consideration, there was a very, very um, uh, long uh, reach back into time, but you know, it, it leaves uncertain whether other retrospective legislations uh, might be contrary to fair and equitable treatment. So. One of the issues at the moment that I always make the point is we don't use the tax certainty uh, um, uh, uh, banner for arbitration. And that's because obviously we want as much certainty as possible for taxpayers. It's important that they have that so that they can help build up your country and you can reach your sustainable development goals. Uh, but also the government needs a certain amount of, of certainty. They need certainty that the revenue that they've legitimately calculated will be coming in, that, that the decisions that will be made in a tribunal will correspond to the agreement they've made. And, and this is what I think is the biggest issue in this area at the moment, trust in the, uh, the way in which arbitration will be managed so that it represents not a lopsided view in favour of either the capital export or the capital import or the developed country or the developing country, but fairly reflects what's been agreed in the agreement between the parties. And that's, I think, is still there's not sufficient trust in that. And there's a few reasons uh, for that. I, I always say it's too simplistic. People often say, Countries complain because they've lost sovereignty. And I don't think that's the case. Countries, as often been said, if you give up sovereignty in one area, you get some sovereignty in another way. Your corporations, if you have corporations, get benefits in other countries. You get the security of knowing that, that uh, those in other countries will feel they can invest in, in you. So, you know, sometimes you give up sovereignty, but you give it up for all the, the right reasons. But I think the concern is, is a little bit deeper than that. It's the concern that you might be giving up sovereignty and you don't know what you're getting in return. And again, the, the experience of the investment treaties is very important because uh, a lot of people who negotiated those treaties are really surprised at some of the decisions, the breadth of the fair and equitable treatment provision and so forth. So that's what I think it is really about, the concern that sovereignty has been given up and what was expected in return may not be forthcoming. And there's a lot of other aspects because that, that cause problems for a lot of countries, not just developing countries. The lack of familiarity in arbitration in tax, which sometimes means you think that those that are familiar with, with it, such as uh, Europeans, Canadians, Americans, might have an inherent advantage in knowing some of the ins and outs of arbitration. It's it's you know it's a it's a game of its own and and there are certain rules and there are certain approaches. Even knowing what people have what decisions have been made by particular people in the past when you go to choose your arbitrator is not easy, because a lot of the uh, decisions are are, um, are secret, 
and sometimes they're available in, um, uh, and this is more the investment side, they're available if you have access to highly paid databases. So again, there's some advantage to do more developed countries, richer countries and so forth, and people who are in the club, so to speak. And, and they have a concern that the same thing will happen in the area of tax. Um, uh, the other thing is that, um, that they have some concerns about the cost. Uh, the cost of investment arbitrations are very high. I mentioned the, the CAN one. Uh, that was just one, one panellist, $1.2 million American. And um, the issue is that, that maybe the same problems don't arise in relation to tax. But if you've got a transfer pricing arbitration, transfer pricing experts don't come cheap. If you use private individuals in that arbitration, where a lot of the expertise, the high level expertise in transfer pricing is, a lot of people in government spend time in government, become expert in transfer pricing, but then join the private sector. Um, so a lot of expertise will be in the private sector. That won't come cheap. Someone has to pay for that if they're going to be arbitrators. And this is one of the issues at the moment. You know, who should be the arbitrators? Should it be just government officials? Um, some countries prefer that approach um, because they think they, it, it's easier to, find, to make that a balance between developed and developing countries. Um, but you do have issues there about finding not just the expertise in some countries, but also do you really want your best transfer pricing experts in government to be spending their time sitting on panels about other countries' transfer pricing issues, or do you want them to be doing their auditing and, and, and so forth in your country? So there's a real challenge at the governmental level in, in, in being able to free up some of your best and brightest um, and, uh, and, and making use of them. And often they're only with the government for a short period of time and then they'll go into the private sector. Um, so one alternative is to get uh, private sector experts in and undoubted expertise. And, you know, without suggesting anyone will enter into this with the wrong motivations, it's really tricky to find the independent transfer pricing experts uh, the academics, for example, who don't advise multinationals all the time because you don't want that. Uh, it, it's or, or, and who are um, uh, you know can be truly independent, even however much they try to be, not just being independent, but uh, but being seen to be independent. So this is actually one of the debates at the moment. Do you use private sector experts in this area? It's very interesting because the. The public documents the OECD has put out, which have wrestled with this issue, talks about whether there should be independent experts or government officials. You know, one of one of my few interventions in this debate publicly was to say I don't really like that because it suggests that the government officials are not independent and maybe not experts. You know, I think it should be governmental or non-governmental uh, independent experts because. You want to express the idea that if people from the government are in these panels, they should be acting independently and they should be experts. And that's that's certainly part of the mechanism at the moment. But because of this unusual use of words, you have the independent experts, which is private sector, <laughs> and you have the government officials, which uh, suggests that the government officials may not... Uh, may not be independent of their governments and uh, may not be as expert as they should be. Not, not how it will be, but it's just a, a, a strange uh, use of, of words in my case. Um, so as I, I mentioned tax certainty, and one of the reasons for the concern in developing countries is the fact that when tax certainty is mentioned, it's usually tax certainty from the perspective of the the taxpayers, and that's important. You know, I, I think the term is overused. I noticed that in the public documents, the reference is to a tax certainty secretariat in the OECD to deal with the arbitrations. And you know, I almost think there's a bit of spinning there because the the the, the fact is, first of all, you're never going to get complete certainty. Let's let's be honest about that. You should strive for as much certainty as possible. But the certainty should 
be again the certainty that the agreement which has been reached by countries should be um, reflected in the decisions of the arbitral panel and that certainty for governments in terms of that they don't get unexpected surprises in the tribunal decisions is just as important as certainty for, for other stakeholders in tax systems. Um, now, the one of the, again, one of the tricky issues here is that the idea of tax certainty, again, has been um, affected by the fact that the, the, the term has been attached to two very complex, <laughs> ever um, evolving um, uh, and difficult texts. So this, this should remind us that, you know, if, if you want tax certainty, you don't just need a good arbitral system, you need clear underlying norms. And that this is one of the issues at the moment. You know, is there enough certainty in the text? And this is not a criticism of the OECD. There's still some work to be done. But the texts are so sprawling and there's so much detail to be covered that you won't get tax certainty just through a wonderful arbitration system if there's not sufficient certainty in the texts. And that might be particularly the case for arbitrations because there won't be any formal set of of precedence. Now you've heard that, that there are two forms of arbitration, the baseball arbitration, which is uh, where the arbitral arbitrator or the arbitral panel says, well, we think this is the right result, but the one and the one that got closest to it in their submissions is this side or that side. So they go for one side or another. The other alternative is the reasoned decision approach where they do a reasoned decision and say, we think this most accurately reflects what should be the outcome under transfer pricing principles. Now, when the UN looked at, at this, it, it, it favoured as its alternative, just a, a, an alternative, not, not sort of an expectation it will be followed, uh, it followed the baseball approach. And the reason is because it was seen as a bit simpler for developing countries, um, quicker and less costly than the reasoned decision approach. Um, but it, it's not perfect because, of course, on the one hand, you're telling the people we have tax laws, they must be met. And on the other hand, you're having a decision which may not actually reflect the full operation of the law. Just the, the, the arbitrator has determined what they think the law says. And then whoever comes closest to that um, wins the uh, wins the prize, so to speak. So it's not really uh, uh, um, following the rule of law. In, in it's just getting the resolution. It's putting more emphasis on the resolution than on the underlying basis for the resolution. And you have to ask: Are the benefits of that? Do they overwhelm the the fact that um, uh, people are going to say, "Well, you know, there's no uh, rule of precedent." There'll be different decisions in different cases. You know, we can't do that in our individual income taxes as individuals. Is is this appropriate not to have sort of a, a rule of law approach to the outcome in these very, very important cases, which uh, um, involve technical law um, and uh, where the, uh, uh, you know, the law may not necessarily be reflected fully in the outcome. So the other alternative, of course, involves the, the fact that it might take an awful lot of time and that if, uh, um, uh, it will be the resources of the, the people involved in the decision making, and they might be your government people, and they might also be private sector people who you have to pay at a, at a suitable rate. So there are some real issues, uh, even in the choice between baseball and the uh, the, the sort of reasoned decision. Initially, the OECD sort of seemed to favour the reasoned decision, but then it came round in a later version of the OECD model to the same approach as the UN in favouring the baseball arbitration. The problem is, I mean, this is what Canada and the US use. The problem is that the you know, even the number of, of, of such um, uh, um, uh, matters between Canada and the US has been a fairly closely held secret or very closely held secret, let alone the outcomes of them. And again, this is a, 
an issue in, in the modern world. Is it appropriate to have these decisions behind closed doors, which are not put out in a redacted form and so forth? That's actually one of the reasons why a lot of um, tax authorities have ensured or really very um, much favoured that arbitration in the UN and OECD models is within the envelope of the, of the mutual agreement procedure so that it's still the the officials which are making the decision, not you know, not not others, and and uh, involvement of taxpayers, for example, is very very limited, if any, and um, uh, that's again keeping it within the tax authorities, and that's been a point of of, of criticism that why should there be this this black box? Now there's reasons for and against that. Um, some would say that 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 uh, it allows a, you know, without the the public scrutiny, you can actually get a, a better result than if everything is taken out of context and so forth. But different people have different views about that. Um, in my view, I think arbitration being within the mutual agreement procedure um, is okay in itself, but it should be that there there would be redacted versions of arbitral decisions, which which after all, the taxpayer is ultimately paying for. But there are different views on that. Now, the other thing I would say about certainty is, is with so much emphasis on it, that, that certainty is not a good in itself. You know, the, as I always say, that if you're told that you're going to be shot at dawn and that that's certain, there's no appeal anymore, that's not necessarily a good thing. And I, I think sometimes we treat certainty as being a good in itself. It has to be certainty of a good result. It has to be certainty of a result that reflects what has been reached at, at country level, what decision has been reached at country level. It, it's the same with the current use of the term stability. You know, we're stabilizing the system, we've given stability to the system. It's important to stabilize the system. That's a very important concept, but um, it's very important that you stabilize things that deserve to be stabilized. You know, if you're stabilizing a ramshackle old house that deserves to be pulled down, um, I would say that the PE rule <laughs> in the modern world, the, the physical presence rule is, is so described, then, you know, stability is not necessarily a good thing. In the long run, it's better to pull it down or put something else up in its place. Something good, obviously. Um, so that's uh, something I would like to, you know, the, the language which is used in, in these discussions is actually quite important. Um, I always, uh, as a quick aside, because I know time is running. Um, I always resist the argument in Pillar 1 discussion that Pillar 1 is giving a new taxing right to developing countries, um, because it isn't. Developing countries have that right in international law. Um, there's no doubt about that. It's just that in treaties, that right has not been um, allowed to um, continue between the, the two states in, in a treaty, in most treaties. It's changing a bit, particularly with fees for technical service uh, and similar provisions. Um, so really, it, 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 it's wrong to say you're giving a taxing right. It's just saying that now we will, to some extent, recognise in, in treaties as part of the avoidance of double taxation, we will allow some recognition of that. And of course, there's a dispute about how much should be allowed. But it, it's wrong to say that that is um, giving a new taxing right to developing countries. They already have it in international law. If there's no treaty, they can implement it as they wish. And it's uh, only where there's been a treaty that restricts it that has been a problem. So the question now is not so much, do we give you a new taxing right? The question is, do we upgrade the the, the language of treaties to recognise that you can have an a, enormous physical presence in an area and important relevance within the economy of a country without actually having much physical presence in that case. Yeah, even the very, very conservative US Supreme Court in Wayfair, which is a, a, a not, not a direct tax case, uh, not an income tax case, but they recognise that, that, you know, it was... It was uh, the time was gone when you really had to look to physical presence to find a basis of taxation. 
um, unfortunately, in, in broader discussions on income tax, this, that argument is, is still uh, still being uh, uh, played out. So um, not only do you need to have confidence in the norms that arbitral panels will be interpreting, and you need some certainty in those norms, or you're not going to get, as I mentioned, certainty, however good your arbitral panel, but you also need confidence in the institutional mechanism that will support the process. And this is very important because procedure is particularly powerful in arbitrations. And uh, all parties need to have confidence that the process will be apolitical and will be conducted without fear or favour for one side or, or the other, you know, however the power differentiations may be. Even location is important. You know, I, I've sometimes wondered if all arbitrations were conducted in, in Paris, uh, would it can, would it favour those in Europe and would it favour France in the negotiation? Just being on the ground and being able to respond quickly, would it favour those who have missions at the OECD that have a tax um, uh, a tax role, for example? Just that they're there if there's an issue arises, they can deal with it quickly. I'm not sure of that, but you have to think through all these issues and then think, you know, how do we ensure that that things are as fair as possible. And an example I often use is the WTO dispute settlement provisions because um, they're imperfect too, and uh, but they're putting an awful lot of effort to try to make sure that they work for developing countries. They have rules which have special and differentiated um, application, particularly to least developed countries. They try to discourage countries to bring disputes against such countries. They, they particularly try to promote resolution by good officers, conciliation and mediation. The WTO secretariat gives legal uh, advice and assistance to developing country members um, and, and will actually make available a really well-qualified legal expert to help in a case for or against a developing country. They've also got special training for the um, uh, 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 particularly to assist developing countries. And um, uh, these courses are, are specifically on the dispute settlement regime, not, not even just the substantive issues of the WTO. Uh, they also allowed private legal counsel to appear for developing countries in matters. And that was, I think, was the bananas dispute where developing countries just didn't have the expertise in house to properly put their case. So they sort of, uh, as I recall, they changed the rules to make sure that developing countries had the chance to get experts from uh, outside their jurisdictions, non-governmental people to appear for them. Um, so they could fully participate in the dispute settlement uh, proceedings and have a fair chance of success. Very costly to get such experts in. So they have, um, uh, 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 you know, a provision of those in some cases. There's also a Geneva-based advisory centre on the WTO law, which is set up basically, um, uh, in, in, it, it's, it's independent of the WTO, but it's related to it. And members of that get uh, uh, very heavily um, reduced, at very heavily reduced prices, they get uh, some really top legal counsel to help them with their cases. Um, uh, and you can also get them to help you drafting your documents and, and the process of the case and so forth. So, you know, those are just some of the, the areas which show some of the deepness of ensuring that a system will get that confidence for developing countries. And even then, there's still criticism that the WTO is still uh, doesn't work well enough for developing countries. And of course, the other problem with the WTO dispute resolution is that we don't have any appellate body members at the moment because they made the mistake of having a consensus requirement for appellate body members and one country withheld its consent over a long period of time. Um, so uh, you can't actually have an appeal in the <laughs> WTO at the moment, which is a warning actually when you look at any uh, new procedures. I noticed there's consensus or consensus minus one on uh, uh, a list, I think, of potential panelists in that the OECD documents are out there. So there's a little bit of a risk depending on how it's configured that you end up with uh, countries blocking 
um, uh, so you don't have the minimum number of, of, of people available. So that's something that would need to be looked at. They also, I should say, that they also have internships in the, these, uh, uh, this WTO-related body to help developing countries get the internal expertise they need. So um, just a couple of final things before I finish. Uh, I want to touch upon something that Hans mentioned last time around, and, and he accurately reflected my recollection of the history. In the UN, I was deeply involved in saying, well, why don't we encourage mediation? Why don't we encourage, as part of this trust building process that I've talked about, getting third parties to look at your case and give you advice, but not in a binding way? And over time, we think that a lot of developing countries would see the benefit of that, not only in getting good advice uh, and maybe long-term advice, you might think this looks good, but in the long term, it's better that you follow the normal rules for transfer pricing and, and it, it's good for your um, uh, investment environment and, and, and the way you're seen in the world, for example. And also, it's good, you know, someone who used to be a governmental official it's actually good to be able to say, you know, I didn't make that decision alone. I know we're giving up that, that case, but I didn't make that decision alone. We had the advice of a very respected person who said that in the long run, this is the appropriate thing to do, and this is consistent with, with the law, and we are seen as a country that follows the, the law. So, you know, that, this is something where I, I think there is a room for mediation as a step to arbitration in the long run, getting people familiar with the fact that, hey, these experts often late in their career, they genuinely want to do the right thing. They want to help and they want to be fair. Let's give them a chance to show that without being caught in a binding situation, at least until you have a greater satisfaction in the, the possibilities of, of, of such a process. But as Hans mentioned, and it's my recollection too, the main criticism was from those who most favoured arbitration because they thought that emphasising mediation would take the, the, the uh, you know, the, the force away from the push for arbitration. Now, if arbitration, depending on what happens with pillar one and pillar two, if arbitration, that certainty doesn't do as well as expected, then it might be a chance to look at a broader scope of how do we encourage third party experts in the process without pushing too hard too soon and, and gaining that confidence, which is important. So, um, I also say I don't agree with the argument that arbitrations won't normally happen if you, if, you, if you make it that if you don't agree in your map that there will be an arbitration because um, it, it, even if you do agree knowing that there'll be an arbitration otherwise, it may be you agree to something that you don't really believe in just because you think you'll have troubles with an arbitration servicing it and uh, and uh, um, and 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 so forth and for all the, and being aware of how arbitrations are run as I said procedure and understanding of arbitrations which are very different from normal court proceedings is is a powerful tool in those that that have that um, so is tax arbitration currently a welcome or unwelcome stranger. Um, I'm a public international lawyer and I do believe in the possibilities of arbitration. And I think a lot of the discussions, including from the OECD work, has been very, very valuable. Um, so while I believe in the possibilities, I also think there are some risks that need to be addressed and some confidence that needs to be built in the norms and arbitral system supports, in the arbitral procedures that will be adopted, in the institution that runs the arbitrations, and also something I haven't mentioned in what will be the enforcement mechanisms if you don't follow. Will they apply equally between the powerful and the, un the less powerful? That's a problem in the WTO because often the, the retaliations are easier for the powerful country to, to uh, exercise than the less powerful country. So at present, I think it's an unknown stranger at the door. Um, and in which case, I think we should always be cautious of unknown strangers and we should ask them to reveal yourself a little bit more. And I think developed, developing and developed countries have a right to be cautious before opening the door, um, particularly as there may be some risks that granting arbitration in one case may lead to flow-ons through tax or investment most favoured nation provisions. Um, 
uh, which provide it to other taxpayers. One of the interesting issues at the moment is if you're a non-amount A company, can you say under my investment treaty, I'm entitled to the same sort of treatment as an amount A company in my transfer pricing disputes. They're bigger than us, but for the purpose of the investment agreement, we're in the same position. And I think we should be entitled under the provisions of the investment agreement to a similar third party consideration of our transfer pricing cases. I think that's a genuine issue. I don't know what the result would be, but I think there are investment treaty issues that need to be considered under pillar one, as well as, as those that were mentioned by hands under, under pillar two. Um, the more I look at developments in international tax cooperation internationally, the more that getting a system of dispute resolution or prevention and resolution that all stakeholders in tax systems have confidence in um, uh, seems important before and a necessary precursor before we get to any large scale multilateral agreements on tax norms for the next century, because the, the certainty will only come from a, a confidence that the dispute resolution system will actually resolve matters in the way that was meant to be resolved in the terms of the treaty. Thank you very much, Eduardo, and I, I welcome our comments. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Michael, for such an illuminating presentation and focusing on on arbitration and the problem of, of the trust gap. Now we will have we will start the second part of our um, seminar. So I invite all participants to, to turn their cameras on in order to, to feel closer. Uh, excellent. Uh, I invite, I am delighted to invite Andaman Lim Sakun from Thailand to, to offer uh, her comments or, or questions. Andaman, please, the floor is yours. Um, I, for arbitration, um, how the way I see is that it usually works for the kind of disputes that has international character. So I, I do agree with the pushing forward norms that in tax, in terms of prices, particularly um, the you wanted to push for arbitration. Um, concerning trusting issues, um, I think well compared to investment arbitration. Um, it's, it's, they, ha they have a permanent independent body administering the disputes and um, the process. Uh, while for now, I think for tax, you only have all ECD and it's not, I'm not sure if like it will be done in terms of like the convention, like ACID, um, as wish by the World Bank. But my, like the first thing that, that brings to my mind is that maybe the trust here is, is maybe not the process because the process seems too far Follow the international arbitration norms, like uh, the rules of the of arbitrators, the grounding ideas of why we're pushing forward to that, and the pros that that arbitration system really gives to dispute resolution. But perhaps maybe it's institution. Uh, perhaps um, because even in commercial arbitration, you trust the center administering administering your case. While in here, I think. Maybe that part is missing, so for maybe um, maybe that could explain one of the reasons why a developing country has not accepted it. Particularly when it comes to tax, it sounds like the area of sovereignty that they are less willing to give up unless they are very sure compared to investment arbitration, which is considered some type of special given the number of uh, countries ratifying exit convention. So yes, yeah, so that's my point. I think maybe the trust is not on the system, but on the institution. Okay, uh, Andaman, so what is exactly your proposal that there should be a stable institution? Yes, I think um, it's just true that we need to have clear underlying oh, norms and arbitral systems. So I think with that, we might take a look at at the World Bank and exit, we might have to establish a new body, make it a convention. And um, when you trust, for example, when you trust World Bank or exit, you trust that the selection of arbitrators would be registered to the center, would be independent, would have certain criteria that that the people would trust because you trust the system and because it's established as like a separated entity now, 
um, it seems to be more neutral in the way, in addition to how you design the rules. But I think the institution really plays a role in terms of trust, uh, particularly from, from developing country. Thank you very much, Andaman. Michael, what do you think about that institutional insight that Andaman is suggesting? Yeah, I, well, as I mentioned, I think the institutional thing is important. I mean, perhaps a, a perfect thing would be if the OECD and the UN could jointly administer <laughs> the, uh, you know, uh, uh, proceedings. Um, because I, I, I think the reality is that most developing countries are not members of the OECD. They might be members of the inclusive framework, but, you know, the the the, the secretariat members in the OECD are largely from OECD countries. Now, the tax certainty secretariat might be one that and probably would include people from other countries, but still, you know, with any institution, who's your boss? Who tells you what you've got to do? Who decides if you continue in your job and so forth? So, that, you know, there are issues, and that's not, again, not a criticism of the OECD. If it was just the UN, you'd have the same criticism, even from some UN members, that the UN is, is, is you know, its tax work favours too much developing countries. So, you know, there are some real issues there, and, and maybe the answer is some sort of collaborative outcome. Now, ICSID, I, I'm, uh, ICSID of course, it, it it's part of the framework for, for investment uh, tribunals, but a lot of them, the, the panels are done really sort of independently, ad hoc panels and so forth. And um, um, the problem there is, is that the fact that that's embedded in the World Bank and ICSID hasn't really given the confidence because countries felt they needed to sign up to, um, to, to, to that and to, to the multinational international guarantee agency i think it is um, and it doesn't mean that they will have confidence that the particular panelists which are really decided by the countries will not go off on their own tangent so that's um it's not just a question of which institutions are involved and how much they they are trusted it's it's a question of um being seen to be not favouring one side or another institutionally or in any other sense. It's a it's a difficult thing to achieve, and and ob the obvious way would be, as I say, if the OECD and the UN and perhaps others could get together, maybe regional agencies. But that's easier said than done. Thank you, Michael. Now let's move from Asia to Asia Pacific. Uh, Cameron Morrison from Australia. Cameron, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for an interesting talk on a pressing topic. Um, there's certainly a lot to touch on. Um, I had sort of two questions for you, both related to the, to the biggest issues that came out of the talk, which was sort of a loss of trust in the developing world towards arbitration and, 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 and the related question regarding ensuring tax certainty in this, in this area. The first thing that comes to mind is that it seems to me that it, 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 in the international tax system, you must have some sort of dispute resolution process. So it seems to me that if the developing world is participating, which they are, they, they must be advocating for some kind of dispute resolution process rather than just um, avoiding participating due to some kind of trepidation with, uh, with arbitration. So, I mean, it, what is your experience with how satisfied they are with the MAP system? Um, do you think something close to mediation, like having a, a third party advice provider to assist the MAP process would help or be something that uh, various um, parts of the developing world might be more responsive to? Would making uh, MAP processes compulsory, that they, they must reach an agreement, would that assist? Um, I, I also sort of feel the same way that arbitration is, is the way to go. Um, I wonder if uh, I wonder if there was a, a third party body or a joint body, as you suggested, um, whether that would be whether that would improve sort of the system under the M uh, MLI, where they have the OECD appoint a, a third person. 
um, or perhaps a, a totally different separate private institute and, and perhaps even appointment of arbitrators by lottery to try and remove some of the, the partisan nature of appointing either government representatives or private or private um, arbitrators. Um, so I do wonder in your experience what you think the position is, I'm sure it's varied, but among the developing world about how to actually go about um, reforming um, current dispute resolution processes or, or what they would be looking for in, in, in future tax treaty agreements. So that's pretty big. That's, that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point about um, ensuring tax certainty, um, there, there does seem to me to be a bit of a pattern in the international tax regime of a back and forth between going from very clear rules that are quite easy to resolve disputes on, but which open up a lot of opportunities um, for tax avoidance and or, or strategic, very strategic tax planning by large M&Es, and then an attempt to sort of move more towards um, a standard or more vague substance language to try and give decision makers like arbitrators or tax authorities more scope to try and rein in some of these practices and possibly bring them more in line to the purposes of the tax treaties they've entered into. Um, and I, I wonder whether you think there, there's really a way to achieve certainty without sort of opening up more avenues for tax avoidance. Um, I mean, the big one at the moment is probably the, the value creation and what, what is meant by value creation. Um, if they were to actually specify this by reference to things like tangible assets, payroll, uh, whatever, you, whatever you like, um, surely that would create quite a lot of economic distortion because you might have uh, strategically minded M&Es uh, attempt to restructure around around clearer rules. Thank you. There's a lot of good things in there, so I'll go through quickly. What do developing countries want? Well, I think um, a lot of them don't like the fact that the Pillar 1 discussions are tied to mandatory binding dispute settlement slash tax certainty. Um, so, you know, they would be happiest if the matters were dealt with under MAP, um, despite the imperfections of MAP. If, if, you know, if there's two imperfect systems, the one where you have more control is likely to be more favoured by you. Now, that's not a long-term solution, um, but nor is a, a, a dispute settlement system that countries enter into unwillingly <laughs> and you know they're, they're, if they are forced to enter into a system unwillingly they'll find a way of of making it not work perfectly because they'll be unhappy with it that's the reality of things so you know i i, I think that um a lot of developing countries some have publicly stated this think that the dispute settlement regime should have been dealt with separately not as part of a package deal now there's arguments against that, that this is such a big change, you need to make sure that it's consistently um, interpreted around the world and that it it's, uh, it, it's uh, operates in, in, in practice. But I don't think we assume from the fact that, that countries are negotiating that they necessarily um, believe that, that, that a system of mandatory binding arbitration and, or, or this system even is, uh, is uh, the best thing. Now, in terms of maps, um, you can have some some tweaks on that. You can, if if things are at an impasse, you can um, have uh, people who are separate from the problem board in, for example. And there's there's actually UN uh, manual on dispute avoidance and resolution, which is uh, very helpful on some of these things to try and help make sure that maps work better. Now the argument that, that you could say you have to reach an agreement. Um, it sounds good, but it doesn't work in practice. If, if someone says to me and my wife, um, you have to reach an agreement, <laughs> then, you know, what does that mean? It, it, it means that someone has to cave in and it's not necessarily the person who should cave in. Um, so uh, the, the fact of requiring, and it's possible that the country in the weaker political economic position 
might just have to cave in in, in that case. So, you know, to say that, that you, you're obliged to reach an agreement doesn't give trust in the confidence that the, the decision will be the right, right decision, um, a, a principled decision. Um, the, there, there are proposals in the OECD uh, a document that's public for random selection of, of participants from certain categories in some of the panels. But there's also roles where the secretariat will propose something. And, and you know, even the proposing of something of, 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 to, to as a certain force and has a certain weight to it because it's, as, as most of you would know as lawyers, being the first drafter gives you a certain power. So, uh, which can be used very effectively. Um, so um, on value creation, yes, you know, it is a real issue because people have been saying we want simplicity. But if you want simplicity, what that can mean is that some of the best legal minds of their generation will be out there trying to look for loopholes. Um, so, um, and this actually makes it quite difficult. The tax certainty from the side of the the um, the uh, country. To what extent do we assume that even if we agree to these rules in pillar one or pillar two, that what the benefits that we think will flow, the anticipated benefits, to what extent will they flow, or to what extent will there be uh, tax planning? around it and 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 that's one of the big issues so yes it's always a challenge if everyone wants simplicity but simplicity can sometimes in some systems give the opportunity to avoid the whole purpose of the thing which is to get the balance right between fairness to the taxpayers but also the right amount of revenue coming to in this case market uh, market countries uh, i mean one of the big things about pillar one is a lot of countries think there's just not enough in it, <laughs> and uh, also that you might get a little bit from amount A, but you actually then have to apply the old fashioned BE type rules to every other company. And this is what Nigeria has said publicly, you know, we think that the calculus is actually favors um, uh, our digital services taxation because we get to tax the non-amount A companies in, in a new way, which doesn't require physical presence. Now you can agree or disagree with that, but that's an issue. But value creation, I mean, the just, and this will be my final response on this. Um, I did an article on this when I was on a sabbatical at Oxford a few years ago. And of course it was a great concept when you wanted to differentiate between companies which were doing real stuff and letterbox companies where nothing was really happening. But then when it got to the issue of, of um, I think some countries trying to use it to say value creation is only the stuff that companies do. There's no part of the market in the value creation. But then when you looked at it, India did a report where it was clear from their report that, that they regarded the intersection with the market as a value creation. Now, in my article, I said maybe it's more a value capture but it's really the same thing. So once you started to try to define value creation, you found that countries were meaning different things. And I, I think I, I always point out that in the October statement, 2021 statement, it's very broad. Everyone said this is an historic agreement. It was an executive level agreement. It was very broad. It's only it's it's not even clear that countries all had the same conception of what they agreed because it was so broadly expressed. So, you know, once you try to define something, you find differences, and this is probably one reason why Pillar One has taken longer than we expected because there's always something new coming along. And now Pillar Two, now we've got the idea. Well, we need consistent dispute resolution. So let's have a a, a, a dispute resolution system overlaid on what is not even a convention, which is a very, as I said, a very tricky issue. So um, sometimes, I, and that's why I think nowadays you don't hear many people talking about value creation. <laughs> Thank you, Michael and Cameron. Now let's move to, to South America. Vicente Robles, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lardo. Hi, Michael. Thank you for the presentation. I had some some questions and I wanted to share some thoughts with, with you and I wanted to know your, your opinion. And first I want to start with 
this concept of, of baseball arbitration because what I was thinking is that from what I, what I understood, it kind of gives some incentives uh, to present a proposal that finally would be the one that's going to be chosen by the arbitration panel. So I don't know if this kind of design of the arbitration, the baseball arbitration uh, encourages uh, to provide a solution that is more convincing instead of more, like you said, close to the rule of law. So if I would be a, a state looking for increased revenue under this baseball arbitration scheme, then maybe I would prefer to, pre to present something that will give me more chances to win in, despite the fact that it maybe doesn't respect, I don't know, unexperienced principle, value creation, and, and, and that kind of, kind of clear concepts that should be uh, under the transfer pricing analysis. So I, I want to first know what, what your thoughts were about this. And, and related to, to, to this point, and you, you, you were talking about the publicity of, of transfer pricing arbitration and arbitration in general, if this encouraging uh, that I was talking about this kind of makes sense, my word is, so if we make public this kind of uh, resolutions of the arbitration panel that may not be decided necessarily according to the rule of law, can it be a danger? And I'm thinking about, if I am uh, Peru, for example, I come from Peru and I have this tax arbitration ruling saying this is a, how I should apply a transfer pricing issue, then despite the fact that it might not necessarily be solved according to law, but these other things that could be uh, presented like the chances of winning, then if I take this, this decision to a local court, then the local court might not be encouraged to apply this decision despite that it was not necessarily founded on law, but on the incentive to increase revenue. Isn't that could be kind of problematic when I, because I, despite that this OECD, the OECD says that this it won't be uh, have presidential value, maybe it would be, could be used as, as a tool to win a case. Like I was saying, despite that it might not necessarily be uh, inspired by uh, rule law decision like you like you were saying and the the other questions that's, that's, that i had yeah you have already submitted two questions i think it's okay, okay. okay thank okay. you very much michael yeah so well baseball arbitration i mean was originally arbitration between baseballers and their clubs to get the, the matter decided before the season kicked off and 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 um you know, at least nowadays, the baseballers, the the big name ones, would be pretty well represented. So, so one of the issues in 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 this area is that some developing countries think, well, I don't really know enough about the process to know what target to hit for, because I really, you know, I don't know the arbitrators, I don't know anything about it. And we can't afford the sort of legal representation that maybe a baseballer would get. But there are some some positives. As I say, the UN uh, Tax Committee came down in slight favour of this approach, uh, where countries want arbitration because of the 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 um, you know the the fact that it's cheaper and quicker. And one of the arguments was um, that actually it encourages a more moderate. Um, claim right from the start in your proceedings that that you you won't go for a, a hugely wacky <laughs> uh, assessment because um, uh, you will be thinking in terms of a possible baseball arbitration and you'll be thinking in terms of of hitting the mark of of what's around likely what's going to be determined um, now you theoretically that best guess you should be seeking for what a fairly maybe a fairly conservative rendering of what the law is um, and you'd be reaching for that it is possible that if if uh, there was knowledge about decisions of a certain arbitrator in the past which there, there might not be there shouldn't really be then you would aim for something similar to what they'd said in the past and analyzing what they've said now this shouldn't be because in baseball arbitration the the idea almost universally is that is not made public because 
um, it doesn't have any real meaning. It, it, usually they, they, they won't explain why they, they chose the figure. They'll say this is the, from what we understand, is because they're not public, um, that, that the general uh, requirements in, in the, the rules are that they just give what they think is the closest figure to the right figure. I'm not even sure if they have to say what the right figure is. Probably not. Um, so it doesn't have any, and none of these arbitrations have formal precedential value, but that wouldn't. So I wouldn't be a proponent for that being made public. Um, I'm not entirely happy with that because, again, it means that big decisions are made and they're not public. But certainly for the reasoned decisions approaches where that approach is taken, I don't see any reason why you can't redact that just as you redact um, uh, some very important Supreme Court decisions in the US on tax, for example, or, or other country decisions on tax. So it is a little bit different, but I don't think anyone suggests that baseball arbitration should be made uh, um, uh, public. But but it wouldn't have any precedent value because there's no context for it, uh, which also means that the public might say, we have no idea whether they paid the right amount of tax or not. So. That's, there's some uh, both of those are imperfect baseball arbitration and reason reason decision if you wanted a president based system you would go for a reason decision and some sort of um, redaction but it still wouldn't formally be a precedent as an arbitral thing but it's like WTO cases or other cases that that you uh, certainly you would look at some of the, the best uh, reason um, uh, judgments but that wouldn't happen in baseball arbitration. There's no re reasoning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael and, and Vicente. Now, let's move from South America to the heart of Europe, Germany. And I invite Nicolas Wolf and Nicolas Leiste to submit their questions, ideally together, I mean, uh, as a group. Would you like to oh, start? Uh, this, uh, yeah, I can start. Uh, yeah, thank you, Michael, for this illuminating presentation. And for some, someone like me who is not uh, at all experienced in arbitra uh, arbitration in general and tax uh, uh, arbitration uh, in particular, it, uh, it's a new world. And I um, was wondering whether uh, there is a, a dilemma and how we can solve this dilemma uh, between compliance of the state uh, compliance to the um, results of arbitration on on the one side and domestic constitutional uh, restraints on the other side because um, maybe for example germany even if they want to com to comply with the result of an arbitration uh, cannot, from a constitu constitutional um, point of view, um, follow it. Um, and this leads uh, to another question. Um, what about the European antitrust law? I was uh, thinking when we allow uh, certain m and um, um, a special treatment, um, can it lead to um, problems with EU antitrust, uh, antitrust law? Um, yeah, this is, these are my questions or my issues. Oh, I cannot hear. Anything. You're muted, Eduardo. Thank you very much, Nicolas Wolf. And now, Nicolas Leister, please. Yeah, um, I mean, again, thank you very much for, first of all, for being here and, and for the insightful discussion. Um, I particularly found um, the, the talk around the discussion around um, choice of tax arbitrators to be quite um, interesting, thinking about relying on perhaps private sector arbitrators versus using um, public sector experts. Um, and I, I think it's an important consideration, particularly also for, for developing countries to take who might have very differing access to, to arbitrators in comparison to say, let's say um, developed countries who may have more experienced transfer pricing experts or in their employment or, or um, that can act as arbitrators, uh, whereas perhaps uh, certain developing countries might have to 
rely on on those whose interests actually uh, lie closer to m and or developed countries. Um, so with regard to that, I was kind of wondering um, how much of a barrier to, to the use of tax arbitration um, does this kind of conflict of interest of arbitrators really represent from the perspective of, of developing countries and whether certain mechanisms like uh, arbitrator pay restrictions might perhaps resolve some of the issues um, around both arbitration costs and conflicts of interest. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Uh, Michael, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, on, on the first Nicolas's uh, question, um, yeah, I, I can't really speak specifically about European law, and I tend not to talk about particular countries' law, but um, my understanding is that Germany and its 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 profile on um, for the MLI has said that that um, uh, arbitration is uh, is available to it in tax matters, and and I think they have some provisions. I don't know about the basis of them in some of their treaties, and and um, and of course there's the EU arbitrations that have happened on transfer pricing. So. I, I presume, and others would know better than me, I presume they've dealt with any internal issues. It, I mean, it is a strange setup in we're saying that that uh, that the map procedure is between the the two competent authorities, but the competent authorities have to follow the decision of the arbitration. and And perhaps one way that some countries deal with any constitutional issues is that, they're not actually, the arbitration is not actually being enforced directly. It's just that the, the uh, competent authorities are saying, we will follow what the arbitrator has said. So that, that might be, and, and you know, I'm speculating here, but it doesn't seem to be that the Germans uh, think they have a problem with arbitration. That's possibly one, one uh, reason about that. Um, the other um the the uh, the second nicholas and i may have missed something from the first nicholas nicholas wolf so let me know afterwards if i've missed something and i'll come back to it but uh nicholas lasty i think it is um the the conflict of interest issue is um it, as always in these cases it's not just about conflict of interest but it's about the appearance of conflict of interest um, and I'm sure that any arbitrators, whatever we call them from the private sector, would try to be as fair as possible. But to give you an example, in the, in the world court, if you have a case that you're a party to and you don't have a judge on the world court, you get to put an ad hoc judge on. And the reason is not because the ad hoc judge is expected to decide in your favour, although they often do, not always, um, but it's because the idea is that they will understand a little bit more about the context from your country. Not, not necessarily true, but they'll understand what you're getting at. And one of the things here that that is that, as I mentioned, that even with the best will in the world, you know, I've spoken to some people who just don't get the argument that that um, uh, you know market taxation has legitimacy because the, the market is being whether you apply it on the benefits principle or otherwise that you know the market is there and 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 the uh, you know the education that's gone into that, the infrastructure, the security to the extent there is security of intellectual property protection, for example, that, that, that they've all gone into creating this market. And then it's legitimate for countries to tax based on, on, on taking advantage of that market. And, and some countries say you don't even need that benefits approach, that the mere fact that it's our market suffices. Now, whatever you think of that, you know, you, you, if you're not grounded in that approach, then it's quite hard to come at that. And that will be one of the, the challenges where there are different perspectives. Now, hopefully the different perspectives are dealt with in the underlying norms. <laughs> but if, if there's a rush to get uh, a convention together, and I'm not talking about a particular pillar one, then sometimes the, some of the more difficult things are left open. 
and then you're giving a lot of power to a a, um, a tribunal to to reach decisions on those. So, you know, how you deal with the potential conflict of interest, it's very challenging because the normal thing you'd say, well, we will we will look to people in developing countries who are expert in transfer pricing, but don't spend all their time advising multinationals, aren't in the big four, um, and um, and aren't in government um, because some people feel that that. If, if you have too many governmental people, that the polit politics between governments may enter into it. Now, again, I'm sure that they would try not to do that, but again, that, that will be something that, that has to be dealt with in this, this discussion of whether it should be government or whether it should be private, whether it should be a mix of both, because the, the, the public might feel that governmental people will always decide for their government or the sort of thing that their government thinks, um, uh, even if a case that doesn't directly affect them. And they might feel that, and again, you need to get a balance between uh, um, people from governments with different perspective because of the appearance of, of uh, fairness. So you need to have a balanced representation in the pool of expertise. You need to try to encourage more people in developing countries to get interested in transfer pricing in a way where they can participate in the process. I mentioned WTO internships. You need to assist developing countries so that they can put their case in the best possible way, not to, you know, not to do anything unfair, but to say it's in the interests of justice that countries always be, be able to put their case in the best possible light. That's as a, as a, a prosecution, as a defense lawyer will always say. But even for the worst crimes, it's very important that there be good representation. So there are things that can be done. I would like to see more discussion of, of you know, how you create an institution and a set of procedural rules that shows we're doing our best to make sure that there's balanced approaches to this area and that they are they know that their job is to to interpret the agreement as as decided between countries, not for them to decide it for themselves. Thank you very that. much, Michael. Um, I could like to ask you a question, if I may, as a final question. Um, of let's assume, I would like to know your prediction on, on what could be the, the future of, of tax arbitration, be it under the World Trade Organization, bilateral resident treaty or, or, or tax treaty law. How do you expect um, tax arbitration may look like uh, within the next, say, 10 years? Do you think that it could be more frequent to see a disputes being resolved by tax arbitration rather than by a MAPS or tax litigation? And if that is the case, to what extent the net impact of this successful tax arbitration would make the, the international tax system increasingly opaque for the median taxpayer? Yeah, good, good questions. I, you know, I have confidence and a lot of that confidence is because I see so many good young uh, transfer pricing and other tax people emerging from developing countries. Um, I think, for example, that whatever you think of the OECD inclusive framework, that the getting together of, of, of people from developing countries with common interests which is something that, that used to happen in the OECD for developed countries, that that's been positive. And also developed and developing country people getting together and realising they have common interests, not just as, as revenue authorities, but also in terms of, of wanting a, a decent investment environment to encourage investment. So I actually, it's good to end on an optimistic note, I am optimistic. As I say, I'm a public international lawyer I think that you do need stronger dispute settlement uh, regimes. And I think that confidence will come from more people from developing country having broader experience, getting involved in these areas, more diversity in the area, but this and, and more um, institutions in, in the South, as we call it, the global South, um, uh, people in those institutions studying transfer pricing because that's a real area where those are, are the sort of people who you can say, well, if they're not advising multinationals all the time, you don't have that other issue. They're not in government. 
um, so they won't, you know, necessarily be the precious of government. That's a really valuable resource, and hopefully some of the <laughs> students here are part of that that future. Because I I do believe in arbitration, but I think we have to build that trust first, rather than to say, as as people often have, here's a new set of rules, and by the way, as part of the the new set of rules, you have to give tax certainty, <laughs> um, particularly for for taxpayers by following these these rules and and you know again it's not a question of, of the OECD whatever happens their work will be fairly foundational um, but I think it's really important that we build that trust before we we uh, we uh, lock people into a system because if you lock people into a system that doesn't work you'll get the response you've got in the investment area where there's a loss of faith in the system and uh, uh, and, and longer term, problems for both investors and, uh, uh, for, you know, for good good investors who are trying to do the right thing, as well as for countries. Michael, Michael Leonard, thank you so much for your invaluable contribution to the LSE Taxation Seminars. And if I may, shall we take the official picture of today's gathering? May I ask you, may I ask all participants to turn their cameras on? Excellent. Ready, steady, go. Thank you so much. And thank Thanks you very much. Right Thanks to the thank students you. and have a good, uh, a good evening. Thank Bye. you very much. Likewise. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.